to Good Game. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Tonight in the show, does the Great War make for a great game? Yes, it does. It makes for an excellent one. We're good to go. I'm a medic, so I can bring you back. Oh, don't walk through the barbed wire. Ow! Owie! Plus, we pump up the volume for two weird music rhythm games, Thumper and Res Infinite. Well, can you name the game for this week? A good music rhythm game is one of those things that puts you into a state of flow, you know, into the zone where you become one with the controller and tune into those deep brain processes. And now we've got two music-based games that take advantage of the VR trend to make the experience all the more intense. First up, let's start with Thumper. This striking looking game comes from a new team called Drool and it's designed for play on both regular screens and in VR on PC or PS4. And they actually call this a rhythm violence game, Bajo. Yeah, and I can see why, because it is super intense. Everything starts out pretty easy in the first level. Simply tapping on coloured blocks as they come towards your weird cyber beetle thing in a fast moving trench. But it very rapidly turns into this brutal combination of stick turns and button holds. All while this psychedelic nightmare comes flying at your face. Yeah, it's like being inside HR Geiger's brain or something. All those eerie tendrils and everything folding on itself. And of course, the music. Hard electronic beats and sounds that build this really menacing and oppressive vibe. I just started to feel really tense playing this, but also hypnotised. Yeah, I felt this strange sense of dread just building. And it's the difficulty of it too. You need to concentrate so hard on that twisting, turning timeline, trying to interpret what's coming towards you. And that intensity makes it a really demanding game, in a good way. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think any good music rhythm game needs to be super challenging. Yes, also, it will destroy your thumbs. Oh, did you find you were just pushing really hard on the X button for some reason? Yeah. Yeah, I already need a physio session for these <sighs> cracking thumbs. Sometimes I even had to pause the game just to take a breath and massage my poor, poor hands. But I won't let those leaderboards taunt me, Hex. <laughs> we briefly tried this in VR with the PlayStation headset. And it's visually impressive, but I wouldn't say it really adds much to the experience. I'd happily keep playing this in a regular screen, although I would recommend good headphones. I quite enjoy this in VR. It makes it even more surreal, like you're transported into a whole other dimension. I did get a little ill. Overall, this is a brutal and challenging game. I'm giving it three and a half stars. Yeah, I found it musically a bit repetitive, but I think if you like music rhythm games, you've got to give this a go. I'm giving it three and a half as well. Next up, it's a return for the PS2 and Dreamcast game Res with Res Infinite. Hex, I think this game was always destined to end up in VR. It's like an 80s movie version of cyberspace. All vector lines and pulsing polygons. It's kind of like the Death Star plans and Tron had a video game baby. <laughs> yes, and unlike Thumper Bajo, I think this should only be played in VR, even though you can also play it on your TV. Putting the headset on and going into this world is a proper trip. It really transports you somewhere. It's like you're going into the grid. I've become pure energy. <laughs> now, this original game came out 15 years ago and it's pretty much the same game, but I think it still really holds up. It's not your typical music rhythm game because you aim and shoot at things to trigger the music and beats. But it still puts you in that same sort of zone. Well, I think you could even call this an on-rails shooter as opposed to a music rhythm game per se, but the music is a big part of it. You sweep your aiming reticule around, either with a control stick or just by looking in the direction of your target, to lock onto targets and then blast them. And the result is just a spectacular explosion of colour and sound. It 
It's a real visual and oral experience, and of course it made its designer, Tetsuya Mizuguchi, famous. And he went on to bring us other music rhythm games as well, like Luminous. And Child of Eden, which I loved. I do think this could be a little bit more challenging, though. It's very easy to get through. There are only a couple of times where you risk dying, such as those end-of-level boss encounters where missiles come flying towards you. But the game isn't really about that. This is a fun ride. I'm giving it three and a half stars. I actually think this is one of those unique and really essential experiences, so I'm going to give it four. SSX was one of my, it's still one of my favorite all time games. Because it was not a snowboarding game, it was a racing game that happened in the snow, but it was about this cool fictional place that I really wanted to go, and the music was amazing. I love the music. I was sitting with some colleagues from Microsoft uh, a couple days ago, and they were saying, uh, we were talking around the table, and they said, you know, if you could live in a fictional city, a video game city, which video game city would you live in? And some people were saying, oh, I'd live in Arkham City, and I'm thinking, really, really that's kind of dark. And I'd live in Mercury City, which was in SSX, because I'm Canadian, and I ski, and I love snow, and I totally could dig living in a place like that. So, um, so for consoles, probably, it's definitely gonna be SSX, even though I played thousands of games before that. Ow! And the tricks were ridiculous. And it was like, you know, here I am, I'm snowboarding. I've taken the snowboarding off. I've snowboarded off, I'm spinning it on my head. I'm landing on one hand and, and landing that thing and, and, and it's still a race. With SSX, it was absolute madness and I couldn't believe how long this run was. And then I'm on the ice and I'm ducking a tree and the music's pounding and I'm doing crazy stuff. And I just love that thing. I just love that experience. Yeah, this is X tricky. That was it. That was the one. That was the one. Does it get any better? World War One, also known as the Great War, was a long and bloody part of our history, where devastating modern war machines decimated less developed armies and horrific trench warfare claimed the lives of millions. Yeah, its depiction in games has been extremely varied, everything from Red Baron to Valiant Hearts. Well, now Battlefield 1 accepts the challenge of taking us back to that dark and dangerous time. I've done everything right. Everything. My whole shot in life. All I've done is live my life by the manual. Stupid, bloody machine. Emotional ride hacks. I was ready for Battlefield 1, not Battlefields 1. <laughs> yeah, DICE have done such a good job with this campaign. It hits all those bright, powerful notes while still giving us enough action hero stuff to make it fun. The missions are broken up into war stories. There's no long, overarching plot. Instead, you play through a series of scenarios and short storylines set in different times and battles of World War I. Frederick Bishop? And the best part is they're all little personal stories, and that makes all the difference. The British chauffeur turned rookie tank driver. And our new driver, boys. The American ace pilot who tells tall stories. I'm Wilson, by the way. You must be George Rackham. Sure, I'm Rackham. I'm your guy. The Italian armor-plated soldier searching for his brother. Our task was to support Matteo's battalion. 
we changed the war for Italy. The stealthy saboteur riding through the desert on horseback to defend her people. You're going to tell me how to lie to your train so we can lure it into a trap. And Shane Ramsey from Neighbours doing his flaming hardest to be a bloody hero. What can I do you for? Not you, the boy. We need a runner for the front lines. Really? No. Yes. No. No, I can do it. No. I'll do it. He's got a heart the size of his rock, Hex. <laughs> They're going to shell the village in the fort to cover us. We need to get out now. I, I sent men up to secure the fort. A dead man. Who went? Only those who volunteered, so naturally, all of them. Kids. Well, you remember being his age? Go. I'll pretend I didn't see you. This isn't on you. I bloody loved all these stories, Hex. <laughs> yeah, me too. You feel such a connection to all these characters, thanks to some well-directed cutscenes peppered through each mission. You really root for these soldiers as they go up against tough odds in brutal war. And I just think it makes way more sense to play as multiple characters who have different roles in the war rather than some super soldier who conveniently knows how to fly a plane and drive a tank and do everything else. Yeah, and it keeps it really fresh, you know, new stories, new perspectives. Mm. My favourite was Nothing Is Written, which focuses on the story of a Bedouin rebel, Zara Gufrin, which saw you sneaking about in the desert, gathering intel, stealthily taking out enemies and destroying an armoured train. I just loved being prone on a sand dune, crawling along the sand and then bringing out my binoculars, scoping everyone out. Yeah, it's great how open that mission was. You just go out there and take care of business, Metal Gear Solid Five style. Because mm. that was also in the sand. Yeah. Kind of... How Zara tackled this dangerous and audacious mission was up to her. It felt fresh and different, and I thought it was a really clever way to include a playable female character into the story. A feeling I deigned to express online and was met with a bunch of knobs telling me how historically inaccurate it was to feature a woman in any World War I story, most of whom had never even played the game yet, I might add. Women didn't exist back then, Hex. Read a book. Listen to a podcast. <laughs> She was a random rebel who happened to be good at quietly stabbing people. I thought it was smart and insightful, and to dice I say, well done. Plus horsies. Oh. I think my favourite of the war stories is still the rookie tank driver. The performances of the tank crew were so good, and there was character development even in this short story. Which you'll do for us first, you reckon? I'm sick of your whip, McManus. And the mission and gameplay focus twisted and turned. It just keeps you engaged the whole time. Plus, there's plenty of relatable humanity in there, some levity in this dark situation. Bloody whoa, 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 no, 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 don't, don't swear. She does not like it when you swear. Finch. Watching so many of these stories play out, it really draws more of a focus to the terrible loss of life. We came from all over the world. So many of us thinking this war would be our rite of passage, our great adventure. Let me tell you, it was no adventure. It's not gratuitous at all. It's just chaotic and terrifying and really quite sad. Yeah, and this war wasn't that long ago. And I think the game achieves its goal of trying to get us to think about how lucky we are to be alive today and so far away from something which was just a complete nightmare. Come with me. Yeah. Look! Look at that, huh? Kid, you lied your way to hell on earth! I just... You just wanted a statue of yourself in your town square. I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Come on, kid, get up. Come on. Come on. I'm gonna die. No, you're not. You're Australian. We're impossible to kill. Much of this campaign is pushing through bleak, muddy, war-torn streets. You're often reminded of how hopeless some of the fights were. Yeah, especially when you're trudging through no man's land or being mowed down by machine gun fire. Many of the battles in World War I were just meat grinders, where huge amounts of soldiers were thrown against automatic weapons and just decimated. So it's rare for a video game to actually hit these historical notes so well. There are some large-scale battles, such as the blimp and plane warfare scenarios. Many more targets. Hang on. Doesn't it look incredible, though? Oh, this game is so beautiful in a really dark, desolate way. Oh, and that frame rate we played this on PC? Smooth. 
The mud, smoke effects and artillery bombardment sections are the graphical heroes of the single player campaign. On the ground though, I just expected more troops to be about. I mean, things got intense, but I only ever really saw sort of around eight-ish soldiers around me at any one time. Yeah, I noticed that too. I'm wondering if it's a technical limitation or just a design choice to keep the fights really tight. Mm. I don't want to say it's the console's fault, but it probably is. <laughs> you definitely need to play this on the harder difficulties. It's pretty easy on normal, so you won't really feel that huge, insane battle pressure unless you pump it up to hard. Even so, I absolutely love these missions because they really embraced what a Battlefield game is. You know, it's a sandbox and they give you tools to use at your disposal. It's not a strict linear experience, and while this can cause some stilted moments here and there, like how I kept losing my repair kit in the tank missions. Best needs repairs. Hurry before Jerry regroups. It also leaves the player with lots of choices in any situation, and that just makes the game more interesting. I was surprised with how much focus was placed on stealth. I mean, you're never specifically told to take the stealth approach. You just kind of figure out that making noises or throwing shell casings will get guards to move. Those soldiers really love looking at those shell casings, don't they? Yeah. It's like they've never seen one before. And they just like bend over and stare right at it. It's like, what could this be? That's a shell casing, I think. <laughs> I found it so rewarding to clear a zone without getting the enemy's attention once, but I have to say the AI doesn't really pose much of a challenge with that. You can pretty safely run and gun it. <laughs> and they make themselves pretty easy targets. It still is above average AI though, I think. They do try to take cover and displace you with grenades. I thought it was convincing. We did encounter a few bugs, however, such as guns not firing, and this standoff I had with a tank. So, are you gonna shoot me? Do I shoot you? you are you gonna shoot me? No? It was a really tense moment before it became so comical. <laughs> my biggest bug was that I could just never get my binoculars to work properly, and you have to use that so much in the actual game. Yeah. Also, sometimes just aiming weapons in a vehicle wouldn't work unless I plugged in a controller. Heavens above. You ever seen anything like this? I have. I'm sorry to say it. Listen. These are annoying, but it certainly doesn't have the launch woes that Battlefield 4 did for like a year. There was one really strange design moment though, Hex, where you're, where you're lined up to shoot this guy who's fighting your friend on top of a blimp, and you can't shoot him. You're meant to actually be shooting the blimp. You okay over there? Shoot the damn yeah, but I think if you shot him in that scenario with a gun that size, you would have killed them both. And the idea was to try and save your friend, right? Yeah, but I mean, that should have happened then. Like, the weird part was they lined it up so the crosshair was like almost on the guy. Yeah. So for, it, it was just a bit clumsy, you know? That's what my brain wanted to do. Because then you could see them both in shot while you're doing all the blimp stuff. It was just, you know, keeping it all contained. But from a player perspective, it's confusing. We played too many COD games where, you, you know, you're shooting rockets at people and they blow up <laughs> and the other, everyone else is fine. <laughs> Now the weapons are really interesting. I love them, Hex. They're so rickety, but also, you know, they handle well and they're authentic to the time period. Yeah, just like those planes. I mean, who can fly those? It's crazy. No, that's just you. Yeah, okay. Well, obviously they've taken some liberties with the guns. Battlefield always tries to balance realism with fun, so reload times and experimental automatic weapons handle much better than anything they would have had at the time. It's all made to feel so satisfying, and it sounds amazing. Oh yeah, the audio is incredible, as always from DICE. It's the rattle of those shell casings and the binks of helmets as they're blown off heads. And if you turn on war tapes in the audio settings, which just makes everything quite a lot louder, it's like a horror film. This is a fantastic campaign, but of course where you spend most of your time with a Battlefield game is online, and this is great right out of the gate. We got over the edge. You ready? Go for the smoke. Um... Go! There! Ah! <laughs> oh, but he blew up at least. He blew up quite well. They got it. Both objectives lost. Oh, oh no, no, let's kill this. Ah! <laughs> that <laughs> that worked really well, didn't it? Didn't that work really well for you? Down. All right, we're going to apples. No! Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm coming, Bubble. I'm going to disarm the bomb. We can do this. We've only got to kill. Yeah! We can do this. Now, 
this side of the game is still a review in progress for us. Battlefield Online tends to evolve and improve for sometimes years after a release. And this battlefield is all about pushing impossible points and getting stuck in trench warfare. Slowly. No, there's people over here. Catch up to Wipeout there. He's going for it. All right, we're just careful. Now we'll go, I'll go get him. This is going to go great. Oh. Bye-bye. Come back, oh, come back, we're doing it, come back. This game is tough and intense online. It's chaos. You have these massive maps with heaps of wide open spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Guy, guy, Mark, ah, and the thought of going over the top and crossing That's them is cool. terrifying. Yeah, there's a lot of trudging up hills under fire to capture points, especially in Rush, which is still our favorite. Ah! Try and, uh, horse, horse guy. Oh, dude. I'm going for it. Hey, there's a plane. This is really fun. Ah, I'm dead. <laughs> Swim. Swim. Oh, is that plane just crashed to be? Although, coming in a close second is War Pigeons. Get that pigeon. Get it. Pick Get it up. That Pick pigeon. Up. Get the oh, pigeon. I, died on, I died on the pigeon, you guys. A messenger pigeon is on the field. Enemies picked up the pigeon. Oh. Your objective is to capture it, then run and find a safe place to pigeon. write a message until you can release it. Go, pigeon, go! We have released the pigeon. Yes. And it's so tense just sitting still in a room writing a note while armies are fighting around you and you know everyone's coming to get you. Yeah, so good. The biggest change to the multiplayer is the presentation and interface. Battle log is dead. Oh, thank you, Gabriel. It's all in-game now, and the interface is really snappy and makes sense. You buy weapons using earnable war bonds to unlock stuff. I'm gonna buy a new gun. Uh, I can't afford it. And instead of unlocking and customizing vehicles, if you spawn in a vehicle... Guys, I got a plane. You now have a unique loadout and class flying. for that. Flying, you guys. Nice. Ooh. Okay, nice take. Oh, that's, that's not a good plan. <laughs> Sorry, whoever that was. There's some other small tweaks to the classes as well, and I find it all really interesting. More to unlock, yes please, Hex. <laughs> Another new mode is operations. The British have landed on our shores and are threatening the entire Alfo Peninsula. It's a bit like Rush, except they're based on real historical scenarios, and one side gets limited attempts to win. This is really nice having a sort of historical narrative mixed in with a game mode, with speculation on how history might be different had a particular side lost or won. And they are long battles too, which is great. And there's these big behemoths like blimps and trains, which can turn the side of a battle really quickly. Oh, watch out, wipe out. Yeah. <laughs> Coming right for you. I got oh. it. Oh. 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 I'm so glad they've made this operations mode because it's a big meaty battle and it feels like it's more significant. <laughs> nice. Also, the screams of the soldiers and the whistle blowing as you're, you're charging to the next point, it's so intense. Everyone home for butter and scones. Not this time, though. There's lots of other little details as well, like now instead of just opening doors, you can sprint and bash through them. Oh, so fun just busting into a room for a firefight. Yeah, awesome. I also liked how you can blow holes in the ground with dynamite or grenades, and then, you know, that kicks up all this dust, but you can also use the hole for cover. Oh, it made holes in the ground! It made holes in the ground, you guys! And there's a bunch of new mechanics which are all balanced really well, such as the gas, which slows you down and messes with your vision. But when you put your gas mask on, you can't look down iron sights. The bayoneted charge is super useful too, but you'll become exhausted if you can't find your target. <laughs> yeah, charging with bayonets out really made this game for me. Oh. <laughs> I just saw you go charging fast. <laughs> but I think what I actually like most of all is how they have evolved that presentation. Now when you're spawning into a map, you just zoom right in, and then when you die, you zoom back out, and you see the whole battlefield. And the way you get in and out of vehicles now, you know, there's no teleporting and virtually no black screens. It's so seamless and immersive. the boring part of the tank. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, the whole interface is so clean and well-designed. You know, I think with this historical setting and that excellent single-player campaign, this is the best Battlefield yet. Plus, it's such a big game online. Ah. Aside from those few little niggles that we had, I think it's easy for me to call this my favourite Battlefield, so I'm giving it four and a half. 
Yeah, you know, we've seen this setting before and these weapons, but never on this scale. And I think with such thought behind it, it's a really mature shooter. So I'm going to give it four and a half out of five as well. You ready to push? Are you ready to do this? Yeah, let's do it. Let's push, go! Oh, I'm stuck in a rock. Oh! <laughs> oh, I'm stuck in the corner of the tank. Oh, like, worst push ever. Oh, we so, did you name the game for this? Wait, Fajo, we need to tell the viewers about the Christmas competition. We want you to make a video that asks the question, did you name the game for this week? And the best entries will win a mystery box of crap from everyone here at Good Game, a much coveted prize. Who can resist the lure of the mystery box? We hope to use these videos in the show and it must be in video format, but it can be an animation or some sort of creative mixed media, just nothing that has any copyright to it, of course. And uh, to give you an example, here's one I prepared earlier. Spent a bit of time on this hex, oh, enjoy. Did you name the game for this week? Uh -huh. Well, that was a fine effort there, Bajo. Or you could aim for something a little more stylized, like uh, this little video that I put together. Well, Hex, there she is, the Forgotten Realms. We've never been this far before, damn tootin'. Bajo, I can feel it. Every step brings us closer to the center of the maze. Yeah, this game's pretty darn tootin' amazing if I do say so myself, which I do, yes I do. What, did you name the game for this week? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't believe I did. I think I named it last week. Well, time to saddle up and hit the road. All right, gonna put it by the bootstraps. Saddle up down the old bootstraps. Mm, mm. Mm. Now you have both ends of the spectrum, so just aim in there somewhere. It needs to be between 5 and 30 seconds. And pose the question, did you name the game for this week? Yeah, and you don't need to put in a game for people to guess because we'll do that. Uh, there's more information on the Good Game website. So, did you name the game for this week? Mm. It was Motorhead on PlayStation and PC from the late 90s. This racing game set in the near future was all about you reaching breakneck speeds to win the Transatlantic Speed League. And it was unnamed the game because it was developed by DICE, the same team behind this week's Battlefields 1. Next week on the show, there be Titans, and they be falling again. Classic Titans. And just in case you didn't think we're in the thick of AAA time of year, there's also Civilization 6, where we lose our entire lives having one more turn over and over again, and no sleep. You're plotting a new course again, aren't you? The currents before us are ever changing. We must adapt and press forward. Well, until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bunch you out. You know, I saw in the uh, Titanfall 2 footage at E3 this year, there's this robot companion oh, that you have. Oh, yeah, and the you single know? player campaign. Yeah, it looks really cool. Um, but I bet it dies. It's totally going to die. No. You're going to form a bond. You, it's going to learn to love, and it'll die. I don't think you. they will do that. They'll totally do that. Should we wager? Sure. If I win, you have to buy me a delicious brunch, and if you win, I have to buy you a delicious brunch. Yeah, okay. But, but either... heaps, heaps of, like, expensive avocado. Yeah, we're not taking photos of any of it, though. Oh, come on now. No. I will not have that. I have a brunch. responsibility as to, a frequent to bruncher. To whom? Who is this for? To my doting followers. Look at this food that you're not having. This is the food I'm having. That's what it says you've to me. You've taken photos of your food and you've texted it to me, even though he doesn't upload it to social media. Yeah, I'm not going to put that out there, but I know you, you love it. It's you because of your friend. I'm doing it as a friend.